I noticed something at my last reenactment, the Battle of Springfield 2019, that I thought might warrant a quick little video. Or, well, to be more precise, it was actually after the event that someone pointed this out to me. It was mostly as an aside, an interesting little observation, as we helped to strike our camp. It definitely wasn't noticeable during the reenactment itself, but once we began clearing away the tentage and the pieces of furniture, covering up all the fire pits and hauling away the materials, it became immensely obvious. It was the impact, the effect, that this simple and, when compared to the real thing, exceptionally tiny little camp had on the environment which it occupied. It was first clear at the ground here. You see, this was once the fly tent of the Fusilier Regiment von Nipphausen, a uh, Hessian regiment. You see, when it stood, there was a table kept at its center. Naturally, over the weekend, its members and visitors would walk around that table, trampling and trotting down the earth beneath, to where now you could clearly make out the near-perfect outline of where that tent and the table once stood. And look here, even more distinctive, the tentage of the 5th Connecticut Regiment, where again we see that trodden earth surrounding the green place where a table once stood. And another excellent example, this is the place where a fire pit was dug, the topsoil being cut away in square and then laid aside for the purpose, before now at the end of the event those squares being replaced into the ground to more or less cover it back up. You can see where the original pit had lain, and the now trodden ground upon which once sat cooking utensils, benches, and of course the expectant feet of soldiers hoping to warm themselves in the early morning. And finally, while I understand that it's not anywhere near so obvious here, we have the piece which most certainly stuck most palpably in my mind. This used to be the chief area where the soldiers' tents were erected. You can see the original appearance here. Like a little village, they formed perfect roads between ranks of tents, and, as appropriate for a military camp, there was also just enough spacing between each tent to allow a little alleyway between them. This is just in case there is an emergency of some sort, like a fire, perhaps, or even a raid, for that matter. You want to ensure that men may move quickly within the camp, so each tent should be spaced enough to allow movement between, at the very least by one-man files. But looking back at the empty plot, based on those roads and alleys, that grid of the original camp, can you make out where those tents were? You see, just here, along quite a long path, you can see where the earth was actually trampled underfoot by reenactors and spectators alike. Now, it's not all too much, but it's still very distinctly visible, and along a very large, comparatively, area. Unlike the earlier spaces, this is not a condensed area, but very wide, and all the same, we still see the ground suffering as a result of all those trampling boots. And look here, you can even see the hint, the faintest hint, of those alleyways between each tent, that little strip of brown where feet were again crossing freely between. Now, I, I know, I, I may be making an awful lot out of what seems like very little, but consider the immensely smaller scale of this encampment when compared to what you might have more regularly seen historically. This event was a weekend. People started arriving probably at the earliest midday on Friday, most of them only on Saturday morning or late Friday night. And by 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening on Sunday, again at the latest, the entire thing was completely cleared away. This encampment wasn't even there for three full days, and it only had, well, this many people. And in that short amount of time, with this tiny, again comparatively, number of people, it had already caused a distinctly visible impact on the very ground which it occupied. It changed, if only for a few days after, I imagine, the very environment around itself. Take that principle and scale it up. Scale it up massively. Instead of a few dozen tents, make it a few hundred tents. Instead of a couple of reenactors and visitors, make it a few thousand real soldiers and camp followers. 
Instead of a reenactment with a few daily displays, make it a fully functioning military camp with hard labor being performed, with patrols moving throughout, with military reviews and drill and parades being carried out at all hours of the day. Instead of this view of the ground being browned a little bit, imagine the devastation of a natural environment. The pathways becoming entirely devoid of greenery or growth of any sort. The channels filled with mud being mashed and churned by the tens of thousands of feet of boots, of hooves, and wheels of an army in camp or on the march. And imagine a large, beautiful field of green and lush countryside, and how totally altered, how totally twisted it must be by the mere presence for even a day of a proper military encampment. And once the army departs, imagine how long the ghost of that army on the physical ground itself must remain. This is to say nothing, of course, of the built items which they must also inherently be leaving behind. Not only trash and rubbish, of course, but misplaced items. Musket tools and buttons and cloth and flints and buckles. All these things that simply fall off the wagon, quite literally, as the army moves along. I have been aware, on an academic level, of course, that an army would impact the environment around itself. Of course it would. Th that much is obvious, so long as you just think about the nature of an encampment for a little bit. But it was only after this little legacy of ours from the weekend of Springfield 2019 was pointed out to me that the fullness, or at the very least, something a little closer to the fullness of that knowledge truly hit me of just how massive an impact an army must have on the environment. And it's that emotional, alongside the logical realization and knowledge that is just one more incredibly palpable, incredibly real, incredibly worthwhile element to this, the reenactment hobby. Thank you all so very much for watching. I, I know that I drawled on for a bit with this one. Uh, definitely turned out to be longer than I expected, but well, then I suppose you've all come to expect that sort of thing by now. Uh, but in any case, of course, a, a particular thank you to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com. It is by virtue of their generosity that I am able to carry on making videos like this and doing the work that I do. And of course, my dear viewer, thank you for watching. I do hope you enjoyed, and of course, until the next time, I am, and I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants. <laughs>